Chapter 1 Conscripted Forward! Forward! Chief, the formidable Draxarian operations commander on Bolox 4, commanded with a near laugh, his tongue flicking in anticipation. Clear this sector by day's end, or become our feast tonight. We start anew tomorrow if you fail. His words, chilling and merciless, resonated directly in the ear canals of his human warriors, transmitted through bio-implants. Each warrior, intent on surviving another day, listened to the chief orders with grim determination. These implants, performed before the application of their protective gear, were a torment in themselves. Unlike the smooth black glass headgear worn by the Drexarians, the human version was a nightmare of pain. Thousands of living strands from the armor bored into their bodies, each igniting its own fiery agony. The helmets, covering everything but the eyes shielded by red glass screens, were a haunting reminder of ancient Spartan warriors. Yet these were far more sinister. The long, pointed chins of the helmets added to their intimidating appearance. In this dire moment, the distinction between the two races was stark. The humans, encased in their agonizing armor, stood resolute yet pained, while Chief Drixarian reveled in the cruelty of his command, his appetite for their adrenaline-fueled blood barely masked by his casual demeanor. The battlefield of Bolox IV, scarred by war, bore witness to this brutal symbiosis of fear and power. Jackson, get those kids in the fight, or we're done for, Rook barked, his gaze fixed on three young arrivals that the Drexarians had snatched from Earth on their last raid. Barely twelve, Rook guessed, judging from their stature. Their features were obscured beneath dirt-stained dark brown uniforms and black helmets which signified they were new, but one was unmistakably male, and the other two, female. In the Draxarian ranks, gender was irrelevant. Rook had witnessed this grim scenario play out too many times. The Draxarians were indifferent to who they thrust into battle. The outcomes were always the same, either devoured by the Draxarians or what Rook considered a kinder fate falling swiftly in battle. His twenty years of forced service, since his own abduction at fifteen, had numbed him. He no longer felt sorrow or empathy, just a hollow relief when one died quickly, spared from the horror of becoming a Drixarian snack. This time, it was the boy who met the quicker end. Rook, with practiced detachment, aimed his belt-fed M249 saw and fired at a three-legged creature that once ruled Bolox IV. His shots tore through what he assumed to be the creature's head, a grotesque amalgamation of limbs and sensory organs where a torso should be. Each pull of the trigger was a mercy, each fallen enemy a silent prayer for the end of this unending nightmare. Jackson quipped, eyeing the two girls as they faced the onslaught of club-wielding enemy creatures. Well, at least we still have two of them. But his humor faded when one girl suddenly pivoted towards him, her rifle rising in alarm. Oh no, we've got a splatter, Jackson realized, diving to the ground just as she unleashed a hail of bullets. Her rifle roared, sending round after round towards Chief, the Drexarian commander in the distance. She emptied her hundred-round drum, with more than half the bullets seemingly striking the tall, dark-cloaked figure. But to her disbelief, the commander stood unfazed, as if untouched by the barrage. As she stood there, stunned, a deep bass sound reverberated from the hilltop behind Sheaf. Before she could even refocus her new optical implants, a catastrophic force struck her. Her body, unable to withstand the immense pressure, burst apart like an overfilled water balloon, showering the scene in a gruesome display. To the horrified onlookers, it was as if she had been obliterated by an unseen force leaving a haunting impression of a splatter on the battlefield. Jackson pushed himself up from the dirt, his gaze shifting to Rook. With a resigned shrug, he remarked, One out of three isn't that bad, as he stood back up. The remark seemed detached of emotion, but Jackson's understanding of their grim reality was clear. He vividly recalled his first battle engagement on a forgotten planet, shortly after he had arrived, just months behind Rook. The memory of his own impulsive desire to retaliate against their Draxarian commanders still lingered. As he had turned his rifle towards their alien overseer, Rook's timely intervention had been a crucial lesson. Rook had grabbed his rifle, 
halting his aim, and explained in a calm, matter-of-fact tone, It won't work. That's why they arm us with weapons from home. It's not for our comfort. It's because they're ineffective against them. Rook's words echoed with the weight of experience. I once saw a guy unload a fifty caliber machine gun into one. Sure, it stumbled, but nothing more. Jackson's own experiences had only cemented this reality. Their weapons, familiar and reassuring in their hands, were little more than symbolic in this war. It was a cruel trick, a reminder of their powerlessness against the Drexarians. As Jackson steadied himself, he couldn't help but feel a grim sense of camaraderie with Rook, both of them bound by the same harsh truths of their existence. Jackson's youthful defiance flared as he wrenched his rifle from Rook's grip, raising it to his shoulder with determination. Maybe he just didn't hit the right spot, he retorted, aiming at the Drixarian's head. But his confidence wavered and he hesitated, turning to Rook with a sudden question. What happened to that gunner? Rook's expression darkened, haunted by memories. He was ripped apart by the implants they put in us. When you hear that roar, they're yanked from your body, reclaimed for the next unfortunate soul. The image was vivid and terrifying, etched deep in Rook's mind. Jackson's resolve faltered. He slowly lowered his rifle, his mind grappling with the gruesome picture of a body torn into nothingness. His thoughts were abruptly shattered by a voice, cold and commanding. The humans saved you from joining that fate. Now fight, or I will relish your blood on my tongue today, their Drixarian commander declared. In that chilling moment, Jackson realized a stark truth. Nothing they said was private. They were always listening, always watching, their control absolute. A sense of dread settled over him, a newfound awareness of their helplessness under the ever-watchful eyes of their captors. Jackson's thought, one of three isn't that bad, was abruptly shattered as a massive rock club crashed against his helmet. The world seemed to spin in slow motion, his senses overwhelmed. His body felt eerily light, a stark contrast to the intense pain radiating from where the club had struck. Oh no, he gasped, feeling the searing agony reminiscent of the helmet's initial fitting. The impact had created a gap in the helmet, but to Jackson's astonishment, it began repairing itself even as he tumbled to the ground. Despite the helmet's protective capabilities, he knew he couldn't withstand another hit like that. Struggling to focus, Jackson saw the creature gearing up for another swing. Reacting instinctively, he raised his saw and pulled the trigger. Only one shot fired before the gun jammed, but it hit one of the creature's three legs. However, the club was still descending rapidly. Abandoning his malfunctioning weapon, Jackson pushed off with his right leg in a desperate attempt to dodge the strike. His evasion was only partially successful. An explosion of pain radiated from his leg as he felt the impact. Gritting his teeth against the blinding agony, he tried to perform a quick function check on his saw. But before he could finish, the creature kicked the weapon out of his grasp. Reduced to using his good leg, Jackson's attempts to defend himself felt futile. The rock club loomed overhead, poised for a fatal blow. In that critical moment, as the club began its deadly descent, Jackson heard the creature bellow a single word with unexpected clarity. Murderers. The accusation hung in the air, adding a chilling layer to the already tense confrontation. The rhythmic thump, thump, thump of a rifle on three-round burst cut through the chaos. Jackson, recognizing the distinctive sound of an M4, watched in relief as three blue flashes burst from the creature's face. Each shot left gaping holes, and one by one its legs buckled until the creature collapsed lifelessly to the ground. Standing behind where the fearsome creature had loomed, ready to deliver a fatal blow, was the youngest of the three new abductees. Holy crap, that was close, Jackson exclaimed, his voice a mix of shock and gratitude. Rook, ever vigilant, was already directing other warriors towards a cave where he had seen several of the creatures disappear. As he organized the group, he called out to Jackson, concern evident in his tone. How's the leg, Jackson? Jackson's response came after a few tense seconds. It was a familiar reply, one Rook had heard all too often in the brutality of this war. 
But hearing it from Jackson, a comrade who had stood by his side through countless battles, struck a different chord. The weight of his words lingered in the air, a stark reminder of the relentless and unforgiving nature of their fight for survival. Jackson's response was devoid of any emotion, a hollow echo of his usual resilience. Old friend, it looks like I'll be taking a vacation. His words, seemingly casual, carried a heavy, unspoken meaning known all too well to the veterans around him. Only the new recruits, still unversed in their grim reality, might not grasp its full implications. Despite the dire situation, a rare smile crept onto Jackson's face, hidden beneath his face mask. It was a smile born not of joy, but of acceptance, a rare display of vulnerability in their harsh existence. Turning towards the young girl who had just saved his life, he asked, What's your name, kid? Nakia, came the reply from the young girl, her voice tinged with confusion. Nakia's puzzlement wasn't rooted in the shock of her abduction from her home in Algeria or the alien implants forced into her body, nor even the bewildering reality of being thrust into a war on another world. Rather, it stemmed from observing the grim acceptance of those around her, the battle-hardened warriors who faced the end of fighting not with celebration, but with a solemn, weary resignation. In Nakia's eyes, this world was still new and incomprehensible, a stark contrast to the veterans who had long since learned to navigate its horrors with a stoic detachment. Her presence, fresh and unscarred by the brutalities of war, stood as a poignant reminder of the innocence that had once been theirs, now lost in the relentless tide of battle. Rook, keep an eye on Nakia. She's got potential. And tell the others. Jackson's instructions were abruptly cut off as he was suddenly enveloped in a blue light, reminiscent of the night Nakia had been abducted. Nakia watched, her recent memories flooding back. She remembered the paralysis that came with the light, the inability to speak or move, and now she saw the same fate befall the man she had just saved. As Jackson was whisked away in the radiant glow, Nakia turned to Rook, her voice tinged with concern and curiosity. How long will Jackson have to recover? She still couldn't fully grasp the meaning behind Jackson's mention of a vacation. To her, it sounded like a respite, a break from the relentless conflict, but the reactions of those around her suggested something more solemn, more final. Rook's expression was unreadable, a mask of stoicism honed by years of war. He hesitated, weighing his words before responding to Nakia. His reply would be crucial in shaping her understanding of their grim reality, the unspoken truths of their existence under Draxarian control, where words like vacation and recovery held meanings far removed from their traditional sense. In this moment, Nakia stood on the brink of a deeper, darker understanding of the world she had been thrust into. As the seconds ticked by, marked only by the distant echoes of gunfire, Nakia's patience waned. She glanced towards the hilltop where the Drixarian commander coldly observed from a distance. With no response forthcoming to her question about Jackson, she decided to head towards the ongoing battle. The fear of the tall, bat-like alien creatures overshadowed the threat of the three-legged ones wielding clubs. Nakia's mind wrestled with her new reality. She understood now what had befallen the other two who had arrived with her. They had succumbed to mental fragility. She had often questioned her own strength, raised in a religious household and grappling with her preference for female companionship, a source of internal conflict she mistook for weakness. Yet, three days into her abduction, equipped only in a biometric suit and a brief tutorial on her weapon, Nakia felt a newfound resilience. How many fifteen-year-olds could withstand being drafted into an alien war? She mused, steeling herself for what lay ahead. Navigating the rocky, alien terrain, she ran past the twisted remains of aliens who had fallen to their primitive weapons. Pausing beside Rook at the cave entrance, as the rifle fire inside waned, she posed a question that seemed casual on the surface. Why are they fighting with clubs? They must know they can't win. To Rook, however, her question resonated with a profound sadness. Years of relentless conflict had numbed him to the continual loss of life around him, 
each new recruit facing the same brutal reality. But the creatures they fought against, armed only with clubs, presented a stark contrast. Their feudal resistance was not a battle for survival, but an unwinnable fight against annihilation. As the last gunshot echoed its finality from deep within the cave, Rook turned to Nakia, his voice heavy with the weight of unspoken truths. Because this isn't a battle, Nakia. It's an extermination. His words laid bare the harrowing nature of their existence in this alien war, a relentless culling with no distinction between soldier and victim. <laughs> 